welcome our guest is Eileen Fielding. Eileen is the executive director of the Farmington River Watershed Association. Welcome Eileen. Thank you. Great to be here. It's wonderful to have you and I'm really thrilled to find out a little bit more about the Farmington River Watershed Association and uh, what you do in terms of research, education and advocacy. But first I'd like to start off with uh, learning a little bit more about how the association came about, how long it's been around and and tell me a little bit more about its history. Okay, be glad to. One of the things we like to start with is just the name of the organization because not everybody is familiar with the term watershed. And when we explain that the Farmington River Watershed Association is a citizens group that looks after the Farmington River, um, people might wonder why is it not just the Farmington River Association? Mm -hmm. Well, it's because the people who founded the organization uh, back in the 1950s understood that if you're trying to restore a river, uh, a river is only as healthy as the land that's funneling the water into mm -hmm. it. So it's the Farmington River Watershed Association because the watershed is that whole great catch basin of land over 600 square miles mm -hmm. that catches the water that then funnels down into the bottom of the Farmington Valley. So um, that explains the name. <laughs> and, yes. Yeah. And um, the Farmington River Watershed Association was founded in what we like to call the bad old days mm -hmm. before there was a lot of protective national environmental regulation um, that fostered clean water mm -hmm. and actually assisted towns in cleaning up the water that was running through their towns. Back in 1953, mm -hmm. the Farmington River had the same problems that a lot of rivers in the Northeast had at the time. It was essentially an open sewer. The mm -hmm. towns were dumping raw sewage right into the river. Wow. And there were industries that were simply discharging their waste mm -hmm. from industry mm -hmm. directly into the river to the tune of millions of gallons a day. So it wasn't really regarded as a community asset the way we look at it now, mm -hmm. a place for people to go and recreate, a safe place to mm -hmm. be. In fact, it was dangerous and people avoided it. And there were people who could look past that and see that this was a beautiful river and it deserved to be restored. And so the Farmington River Watershed Association grew up sort of naturally right in the communities mm -hmm. of the Farmington Valley. It was local teachers and businessmen and uh, parents and scout leaders and concerned citizens who got together mm -hmm. and said, you know, we need to do something about this. And naturally they couldn't do everything because it did take um, state legislation and, and especially national legislation, mm -hmm. uh, for example, the Clean Water Act, to really facilitate the cleanup of the river over in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. But because of the Farmington River Watershed Association, the communities uh, in the Farmington Valley uh, really had a head start on all of that. And we owe a lot to uh, the anglers mm -hmm. and the people who just like to walk along the river and the people who saw the potential in this river agitating in their communities and agitating at the state level to say, mm -hmm. we need something done here. So would the Farmington River Watershed Association be one of the earliest uh, type of associations in Connecticut? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was uh, one of the first. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, sometimes we compare notes with the Housatonic Valley Association mm -hmm. and the Connecticut River Watershed Council. Mm -hmm. um, there were a number of organizations um, that sprang up and uh, these were among the earliest. And so was it officially 1953 or slightly later than that that the association sort of uh, legally formed? Yeah, it was in 1953 that mm -hmm. we became a 501c3 mm -hmm. nonprofit mm -hmm. organization. And that was after a lead time of people getting together and planning. Mm -hmm. And uh, originally uh, it was mostly a volunteer organization. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, it is still uh, largely powered by volunteers, mm -hmm. although over the years, it, it has acquired some staff mm -hmm. and uh, over the years it it has always been focused on as we say preserving protecting and restoring the river mm -hmm. but what specifically that means from one decade to the next has changed sure. in a way it was easier in the mm -hmm. 1950s because 
anybody could walk to the river and say, I can see this river's in trouble. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, it smells, it looks terrible. Right. I wouldn't let my child near it. Uh, people would get sick if they got in the river. Mm -hmm. And um, that was the early era of pollution that needed to be addressed first by the Clean Water Act. Okay. Uh, the first thing to do was help the towns build wastewater treatment plants so that they weren't discharging raw sewage. Sure. The next thing was to regulate what industries could discharge into mm -hmm. the river um, so that those sources uh, would cease to be a problem and also mm -hmm. some industries simply changed mm -hmm. or, or relocated. Um, and then it was sort of the era of the new regulations and the state and the municipalities had to figure out well, how do we implement these mm -hmm. and, and what's involved? And at that point, uh, the Farmington River Watershed Association uh, was giving some assistance in explaining mm -hmm. uh, what was involved in these new laws and, and how they were to be implemented. Mm -hmm. And at that time, uh, if you'll recall, in 1955 was the Great Flood, ah. uh, the, the hurricanes mm -hmm. and, and the, that really devastating flood that came through uh, the Farmington Valley. And that led to a lot of outcry at the federal level for better flood control, mm -hmm. which is a good thing. Right. Um, and the Army Corps of Engineers uh, planned a big flood control reservoir mm -hmm. up on the west branch of the Farmington River. Mm -hmm. But again, it was the local Farmington River Watershed Association that said, wait a minute, what will be the downstream consequences oh, to yes. this beautiful sure. river? Mm -hmm. um, and let's talk about how you're going to regulate outflow mm -hmm. from the flood control reservoir so that we don't lose our river, so mm -hmm. that we still have a living river. So in the 50s and 60s and early 70s, uh, that's the sort of thing that the, the Watershed Association was um, involved in. Mm -hmm. As the years went by, other issues came up. Mm -hmm. um, how, how much of the uh, river's water could or should be used as drinking water mm -hmm. for Greater Hartford. Um, uh, most people know that it's the Farmington River watershed that supplies all the drinking water for Greater Hartford. This region, sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. so almost a third of the state's population mm -hmm. is drinking Farmington River water. Mm -hmm. um, not literally from the river. Mm -hmm. that's, that's one thing we try to keep clear to people is um, above the main stem of the river, mm -hmm. which is, which is uh, the lower segment of the river. Okay. There are two branches feeding in. There's the west branch and the east branch. And if um, I'm not familiar, what towns are those sort of associated with those uh, sure. branches? Sure. The west branch starts up in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. So it's coming down through um, Beckett, Otis, Sandusfields. Sure. Okay. And then it crosses the border uh, into Colebrook mm -hmm. and then comes down through um, Barkhamstead, mm -hmm. uh, let's see if I can get this straight, Harwinton, Canton. Sure, okay. Um, and then uh, that's about where the East Branch comes in. The East Branch uh, is originating up in uh, Granville, Massachusetts. Oh, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And then it, uh, the, most of the East Branch is not a river anymore. It's mm -hmm. Barkhamstead Reservoir. Ah. So it, that's the drinking water reservoir, the, the main drinking water so reservoir. So it mostly comes from the East Branch then. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then just below Barkhamstead mm -hmm. Reservoir is Lake McDonough. Mm -hmm. And then the little bitty segment of what's left of the East Branch mm -hmm. then joins the uh, the West Branch, mm -hmm. and then it becomes the Farmington main stem. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, there's one big branch that's sort of the uh, recreational West Branch, sure. and then there's the other branch that is the water supply the reservoir. Branch. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And was the reservoir the history of that? Was that also how how old is the reservoir piece of it in Bark Hempstead? Uh, the reservoirs, that's a whole program in itself, okay. but um, the, let's see. So which predates the, which, I guess? Yeah. Did, the, did yeah. the association come up much after the reservoir, I'm guessing, or? Yes, mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the Nipog River, mm -hmm. which is a tributary to the Farmington River, uh, was dammed first. Okay. And then the East Branch was dammed to form Lake McDonough. Mm -hmm. And then it was dammed again 
above, farther up on the East Branch to form Bark Hampstead uh, Reservoir, uh -huh. and that was in the late 1930s. Okay, so so, so well create, before uh, yes, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. the the founding of FRWA, mm -hmm. and and uh, you know keep in mind mm -hmm. this was all drinking water supply, mm -hmm. so this was water that was very clean and pure. Mm -hmm. You know we we didn't have pollution problems um, uh, of the same type that we were sure. trying to address mm -hmm. um, in in industrial pollution sure. in mm -hmm. the 1950s. Mm -hmm. And then um, after that, uh, a dam was planned for the West Branch mm -hmm. that started off as uh, potentially a, a drinking water reservoir, mm. but then the flood of 1955 happened, mm -hmm. and where was the flood control reservoir going mm -hmm. to be? Well, it was, it was going to be almost in that same location ah, up on the West Branch. Mm -hmm. So now you have two reservoirs, one above the other. Right. Uh, one is West Branch Reservoir mm -hmm. that uh, is still potential drinking water supply. Mm -hmm. And just above that is Colebrook River Lake, okay. which is expressly designed to capture mm -hmm. floodwaters coming down from Massachusetts and keep them from roaring down the Farmington sure. Valley and, and creating the kind of damage that the 1955 flood did. Mm -hmm. Although, uh, I have to mention, 80% of the Farmington watershed is below Colebrook River Lake. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, so there's still a big catchment area sure. that could gather a lot of water mm -hmm. and still create a flood. Mm -hmm. Although there are other flood control, control structures uh, up in the upper watershed. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not the only one. It's still not totally a flood-proof system. Mm -hmm. um, and we need to keep that in mind because um, when you start paving surfaces, mm -hmm. as towns build out and there are more yes. and more roads and sidewalks and uh, patios and mm -hmm. swimming pool covers and rooftops mm -hmm. and all that sort of thing, rainwater doesn't percolate into those sure. things. It's not permeable. Right? It's not mm -hmm. permeable. Mm -hmm. It's what we call impermeable surfaces. Mm -hmm. And um, so there is, in some ways, more potential for flood now mm -hmm. um, in our more urbanized uh, towns mm -hmm. than there was uh, back in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that we have to keep in mind. The more you can you can keep your town permeable to mm -hmm. water, um, the better it is. The better the... it is for warding off sure. flooding conditions. Sure. Yeah. You mentioned the watershed area has been, you know, obviously much larger than the river. Are there actual um, areas where there's, you know, there's parts of towns that don't actually touch the Farmington River itself, um, but that are parts of the watershed area. Oh, absolutely, less. yeah. So what would some of those towns be that you would be, you know, concerned with protecting and that as well? Uh, well, um, it might not be an entire town. Towns tend to tend parts of sure. Yeah, towns mm -hmm. tend to be built around waterways, mm -hmm. uh, at least sure. in the Northeast. Yes, because that's what their power source was mm -hmm. originally. Sure. Um, but uh, I think when I was answering your question, I was thinking of the parts of the town that are way up on a hill, mm -hmm. a way, okay. uh, you know, sure. for example, um, Talcott Ridge. Okay, uh, yes, You yes. know, if you're, if you're looking at the big ridge that overlooks mm -hmm. Farmington, that overlooks Simsbury, that overlooks Avon. Right. Uh, right up to the top of that ridge. Is the watershed. Is the watershed. Sure. okay. And you don't usually uh, think of yourself as living in a river valley. Right. When you're that high up. Because that would be the top are. of the catch basin. Yes. Uh, your yeah. in your analogy, right? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. A watershed is really a river valley, only mm -hmm. only including all the way up to the top mm -hmm. of of the mm -hmm. catchment area. Wanted to ask you one other question about the history. Uh, is there any one or two individuals that have stood out historically in the group of citizens who, you know, were really the activists who started the the watershed association, or has that information sort of been lost to time? Oh, the information hasn't been lost to time. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is it's been lost to my faulty memory at this particular ah, instant. Well, that's, <laughs> oh, that's yeah. definitely a remedy that we yes. can, you know. Um, John Leonard comes to mind okay. uh, as, as one of the founders. Um, and there was, uh, I'm struggling here because there was another uh, important founder mm -hmm. whose nickname was Squirrel, and oh. I can't pull the last name. But Squirrel's <laughs> very memorable. <nonetheless>. I remember <laughs> Squirrel. Yes, yeah. Um, and uh, there were a number of others. There were three mm -hmm. or four uh, mm -hmm. in the beginning uh, who really were the movers and shakers. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, interestingly enough, um, uh, the local industries mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, were very supportive of this. Mm. Um, the folks at Ensign Bickford, mm -hmm. for example. Um, Interesting, were, because they yeah. could have, uh, under different circumstances, have had an adversarial relationship since they are yeah. right next to the river and I imagine maybe were at one time um, discharging waste into the river. Yeah. Yes. Um, but on the other hand, mm -hmm. you know, some of their senior executives and mm -hmm. some of their professional staff mm -hmm. looked at this and said, you know what, this is a problem we sure. need to address. Mm -hmm. And I think they felt they had the influence, yes. um, you know, as industry leaders mm -hmm. um, and maybe a responsibility mm -hmm. um, to, to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that in the course of this interview, um, my memory will kick in. Sure. <laughs> and, and if it doesn't, what is the website address? So we can tell our viewers uh, where they can go to get more information because I'm sure while you are a fountain of information, <laughs> there's even more on the website. Yeah, as a matter of fact, when we had our 50th anniversary mm -hmm. um, in 2003, a, a whole historical publication was okay. put out. So if there is a history buff uh, mm -hmm. who wants to uh, um, delve into this in, in more detail, mm -hmm. it is there. Okay. Um, so the website is www.f, as in Frank, mm -hmm. rwa.org. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's yeah. frwa.org to get more information on all the wonderful things we're talking about here and uh, <laughs> certainly even those that we will not have time to talk about, so wonderful. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you as well about uh, the three sort of prongs of what you do at the association would be advocacy, research, and education. I understand mm -hmm. that um, historically I'm sure the association really started off being an advocate first and foremost yeah. for the river. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about how your educational um, programming or services, uh, when that came about, and also um, critically also the research, because I, I understand that you're probably, other than the state uh, and town uh, environmental agencies, probably one of the few organizations that are actually doing research um, mm -hmm. in the watershed area. Yeah, and uh, they, in, in some degree, they all date back to the beginning. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the reasons I can remember John Leonard is because of this wonderful photograph we have of him taking a water sample ah. <laughs> from mm -hmm. the river back in the, mm -hmm. in the 1950s. Um, but That uh, makes sense because you can't really advocate effectively unless you know what you're talking about in terms of, you know, pollutants and so forth. Yeah, exactly. This is why we need to clean this up. Yes, yes. Uh, take a sniff of this, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and the education piece, although uh, FRWA was focused on advocacy mm -hmm. um, in, in the early years, their advocacy was very informative. Mm -hmm. They had a newsletter that was, and as we still do, um, that was chock full of information about the river. Mm -hmm. um, there were substantive information information in those newsletters. So if people really wanted to have background information about the issues that were being advocated, mm -hmm. that was being supplied mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So um, education and advocacy have, have gone hand in hand the whole time. Mm -hmm. Um, there was a time when uh, uh, FRWA was really uh, focusing a lot on community involvement, community inclusion, and having annual river fests, mm -hmm. which were ways of bringing people into the river. Uh, even now, mm -hmm. I, th I think our culture hasn't completely turned around. Uh, from from the era when it had its back turned mm -hmm. to the river, yes. you know the river was not an asset. There was no point in uh, in accessing it. Um, so river festivals really get people looking at the river sure. and enjoying it. That was kind of a nice way to do education on, on uh, sort of a uh, a softer side. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the early two thousands. Uh, a certain amount of soul searching and strategic planning happened, mm -hmm. and um, the organization as a whole, you know, the, the members, the, the staff and the board got together and said, you know, we really would like to be able to produce a one-stop compendium mm -hmm. of everything you could want to know about the river. Sure. And um, produced the State of the Watershed Report. Mm -hmm. which went back to, uh, dates back to about 2003. Is it, that an annual report or? No, it was uh, it was one big effort okay. to, to oh, pull okay. everything Wonderful. together. Okay. So it's a periodic, uh, yeah. have you done it since the uh, 
first time that it was done, the State of the River Report? We have not published another whole volume okay. that's the State of the Watershed mm -hmm. Report. Mm -hmm. But what it did is it pointed us in an interesting direction mm -hmm. um, because it summarized uh, wastewater treatment plants, diversions, dams, mm -hmm. uh, dams and barriers. You'd be astonished mm -hmm. uh, how many uh, hmm. barriers there are in the system that break up the habitat for the animals that for live in the, the wildlife, river. Right? Yeah. Huh. There are many, many maps in the State of the Watershed report mm -hmm. that uh, show the watershed in many, many aspects. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that became clear when the State of the Watershed report was done was what we needed to do next. Mm -hmm. And the decision was we need to start gathering our own data. Mm -hmm. um, just so we know it's being taken on a, on a regular basis. And that was the beginning of our water quality program, mm -hmm. which now um, is run by a staffed position. Elisa Phillips Griggs is our water quality and projects coordinator. And she marshals volunteers. Ah, I was going to say, how does one woman do all that? <laughs> I wonder myself yes, sometimes. Yes. <laughs> she manages to do it mm -hmm. um, with the help of volunteers and interns. Mm -hmm. And she actually has regular sampling stations in over 40 locations mm -hmm. throughout the watershed where she will, um, or the volunteers, will take water samples. Mm -hmm. And uh, those samples will be analyzed for bacteria levels, coliform bacteria, um, various physical and chemical properties, mm -hmm. nitrogen, phosphorus, turbidity. And she even has temperature sensors oh, out there. And I'm not saying this all happened overnight in 2003. Sure, sure, you know, sure. We've been building this pro program for mm -hmm. a while. But the objective was to have long-term data collected year after year after year mm -hmm. after year. Uh, and you really do need to collect it for a long time because in any given year, you, you can have some blips. And oh anomalies. yeah, sure. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, you have high water, you have low water, mm -hmm. you have hot days, you have cold days, sure. and so there's a lot of variation mm -hmm. in the data, and you need to collect it for a while mm -hmm. before any any real trend is going to mm -hmm. start to show itself in a way that's at all convincing. Sure. And so we've we've kept at it. Do you it, do your own testing, or do you send these samples out to a, a lab that you work with? A little bit of both. Okay. Uh, actually a fair amount of both. Mm -hmm. um, the upper river samples uh, tend to get uh, sent to a lab. Mm -hmm. The lower river samples are closer to Simsbury and uh, thanks to the hospitality of the town of Simsbury, mm -hmm. we have our own lab space ah. in their wastewater treatment plant. Wonderful. And so we will mm -hmm. uh, incubate our own samples mm -hmm. and analyze those for bacteria content mm -hmm. and in fact uh, that's some good water quality uh, training that mm -hmm. we give some of our volunteers mm -hmm. and, and some of our interns and um, the temperature data um, that's recorded by data loggers that we just leave underwater mm -hmm. all, all summer sure and then download the data and uh, all of this is made available to Connecticut DEP mm -hmm. because we made a point of collecting data the same way with the same standards that they do. Sure. So that um, it's able to go into a state database and that helps the state mm -hmm. comply with the mandates of the Clean Water Act. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it helps them meet some of their obligations mm -hmm. as well. So obviously you have a, a nice working relationship with the state DEP. Who mm -hmm. would be some of your other allies or collaborators that you tend to work with, um, maybe besides uh, places like the town of Simsbury? Yeah, lots. Mm -hmm. um, I, I once really sat down and tried to explain to myself, so mm -hmm. I could explain it to other people, mm -hmm. what our real value is, mm -hmm. what makes us unique uh, as an organization. Right. And uh, we're a facilitator of collaborations. Mm -hmm. Um, there are lots of people mm -hmm. on the ground uh, in, in the community that care about the river. Mm -hmm. But now that the river's problems are not that obvious anymore, um, except when it floods or when there's litter on the riverbanks or something sure. like that, um, they, they kind of need someone to organize the effort. Sure. Um, right. and, and by that, I don't mean to minimize 
what other organizations do. Trout Unlimited does river cleanups. Mm -hmm. um, local scout troops do river cleanups. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that stuff happens spontaneously mm -hmm. all the time. Yes. But still, yeah. um, you have a lot of concerned people in the community who might not know who to ask sure. about river problems, either in their towns or at the state level. Um, they might not be able to find funding to take care of a problem that bothers them. Mm -hmm. They need a, a nonprofit organization like ours right. to try and find the financial resources right, right, right. Uh, because we might have access to foundations or something sure. like that. So uh, besides DEP, uh, we do work with uh, Trout Unlimited. Mm -hmm. Um, we work with the other watershed organizations, mm -hmm. the Housatonic Valley Association and uh, Connecticut River Watershed Council, mm -hmm. either on advocacy mm -hmm. or sometimes on the ground projects, mm -hmm. like assessing uh, the condition of stream crossings, mm -hmm. you know, where there are culverts that go under roads, mm -hmm. um, and can aquatic animals use those culverts to right. travel or not? Right, and right, right. Is that culvert going to blow out in a storm event, and should we talk to the town about it or mm -hmm. not? So. Um, Something like that might be a regional effort mm -hmm. that we do with several other organizations. Um, we'll work with a Lions Club um, on a cleanup. We might be funded uh, to do uh, to bring in an intern mm -hmm. by uh, a local service organization like the Rotarians. Mm -hmm. um, we work uh, to some degree with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service mm -hmm. uh, when we get an opportunity to do a fish habitat restoration program, uh, a project, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it goes on and on. Yes. Uh, what are some of the other ways, uh, I know you've mentioned Trout Unlimited, anglers obviously really enjoy the Farmington River, and I mm -hmm. understand from my husband, who's a uh, fly fisherman, that uh, the Farmington River is really world-renowned world as a, a river, a great river for fly fishing. There's paddlers on the river. I believe yeah. Satan's Kingdom would be, that yeah. would be the tubing for, for people yeah. who don't know. What other ways are people enjoying the actual river? Yeah, um, uh, the Farmington River's got everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if uh, you're up on Colebrook River Lake or uh, West Branch Reservoir mm -hmm. or Lake McDonough, uh, you can simply enjoy these big lakes, mm -hmm. you know, as places, I mean, you can't swim in uh, some places like West Branch Reservoir, but um, you can enjoy them as lakes. You can paddle, mm -hmm. you can fish. Mm -hmm. And then um, there's an amazing trout fishery mm -hmm. on the West Branch, partly because, or largely because, the water released from the reservoirs comes from the bottom of the reservoir. So ah, it's cold. cold, cold the yes. trout love it. Mm -hmm. And it's released regularly. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, except in drought years like the one we just had. Last year, right. Yeah, right. you don't have to worry so much about uh, the river getting too warm or too low mm -hmm. uh, and slow. So that makes it a world-class trout fishery, as mm -hmm. your, your husband probably knows. Mm -hmm. And then farther below is Satan's Kingdom, mm -hmm. which is a rocky gorge. And there is a tubing concession there mm -hmm. that is very popular. Mm -hmm. And I, I admit I've been on it a couple of times. <laughs> it's fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and how cold is the water when you're uh, tubing it, down? I don't remember it being that cold actually. Okay. I, I've also gone tubing in Ecuador, and that water was much colder. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that was memorably colder. Let's put it that way. Yeah, that would be like melted glaciers, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> so not so cold in, mm -hmm. in Satan's kingdom. Mm -hmm. um, um, and then as you go further down, mm -hmm. there's this beautiful flat water stretch, affectionately mm -hmm. known as the bathtub, ah. which goes from Farmington mm -hmm. up through Avon and mm -hmm. Simsbury. Mm -hmm. um, it's almost like a backwater. Um, a lot of the time you can comfortably paddle upstream mm -hmm. as well as downstream, and that's where FRWA does a lot of its canoe trips ah. uh, because uh, we like to make our canoe trips accessible to as many people as possible. So your canoe trips are part of your education program? They are. Mm -hmm. um, we'll do canoe trips about the natural history of the river or mm -hmm. the archaeology of of the river mm -hmm. uh, or any other topic. We can uh, put an interesting leader in a canoe mm -hmm. to talk about. Interesting. Um, we've had dragonfly walks. Mm -hmm. We even had um, a, we've had bacteria field trips because if you go out on a walk mm -hmm. along the water's edge with someone who really knows their bacteria, mm -hmm. it's 
far more fascinating than you'd imagine. Oh, I bet, I bet. Because a lot of bacteria are not pathogens. Mm -hmm. uh, they're just microscopic they're not organisms. All bad guys, right? uh, no, they're just out there living, <laughs> you know, and you can learn to recognize them. Um, that's not one of the major recreational occupations along the river, yes, obviously. Yes. Um, and then as you get north of Simsbury mm -hmm. and into uh, East Granby and Bloomfield, mm -hmm. um, a lot of people might know that's where the river punches through mm -hmm. um, Talcott Ridge. Mm. So there's a short stretch there mm -hmm. where the river is going through Terrafield Gorge, mm -hmm. and that is as famous a whitewater stretch for mm -hmm. whitewater paddlers ah. as uh, the West Branches for the trout fishers. Interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, Olympic trials have been held there. Wow. And just a few years ago, um, a group of volunteers um, restarted what's called the Terrafield Triple Crown. Wow. Which so it's is, a competition. Yes, mm -hmm. it's a competition with three events. Mm -hmm. um, and I am not a um, dramatic Adventure whitewater paddler. paddler. You know. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I, my paddling is about as exciting as watching a duck. Mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> but, the, yes, but, mine too. But these people. Uh, do amazing things mm -hmm. in amazing whitewater mm. uh, in that gorge. It's it's quite a spectator event. I was just going to say, is there yeah. room for people to watch that? Because that would be very interesting. I would yeah, think. yeah. Well, that is one mm. of the um, the limitations. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's not a big spectator sport venue. Sure. So it's it's sort Video. of uh, <laughs> yeah. You, you kind of have to know about it. Yes. Um, small crowds can gather there and mm -hmm. do um, mm -hmm. to watch the event. Qu most often, it's held in April, although not this year. Um, water is low, and uh, some of the national level competitors are off doing other competitions. Sure. So uh, we're going to uh, put it off some. Mm -hmm. But uh, it is a whitewater venue. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that's that's one of the better kept secrets, except in the whitewater community. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, a place actually where we took a dam out. Uh, uh, in 2012, mm -hmm. and I say we, mm -hmm. now there was a collaboration. Yes. Uh, that was Connecticut DEP mm -hmm. and an engineering firm um, and a wonderful construction company and cooperation from the town of East Granby and the town of Bloomfield and mm -hmm. Northeast Utilities. Um, wow, which, that's really, a, everybody was. Uh, whose dam it was, yes. yeah. So you really yeah. were playing the role of the convener there with all these groups. That's Absolutely. And it, and it was one of those. Uh, situations where it had to be a nonprofit uh, river stewardship organization sure. who could really pull all of those things together. Sure. And we did have to reach out to the whitewater community mm -hmm. and say, don't worry, mm -hmm. uh, we'll, we'll bring you the engineer mm -hmm, <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and she can tell you mm -hmm. um, that this is not going to destroy the whitewater run. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and, and in fact, it, it added a play feature mm -hmm. uh, to their run. So, um, if somebody wanted to learn adventure mm -hmm. paddling, um, mm -hmm. is that the spot in the Farmington River, or are there other spots that uh, you can go from being sort of the casual paddler to like maybe a little bit more adventure, and then mm -hmm. maybe not the Triple Crown area, You're but right. <laughs> right. so are there other levels of uh, pl playing around while paddling that you can sort of uh, progress up? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, Speaking for myself, mm -hmm. <laughs> you can start in the bathtub mm -hmm. uh, between Farmington and uh, in the north end of Simsbury. Mm -hmm. And before I go further, I should say, any time mm -hmm. uh, you put a boat in the water, it's really good to check the flow conditions first, mm -hmm. because even the bathtub can be extremely dangerous Interesting. Uh, okay. in high water. Mm -hmm. uh, people don't really appreciate how powerful water is. Yes. Um, you know, if, if someone's getting ready to go in the water, they might think, well, it's okay because if the boat tips, I can swim. Mm -hmm. I know how to swim. Right. I can swim. And it, they don't uh, sometimes stop to remember no, this is a river, mm -hmm. so the water's moving, yes. and it can pin you mm -hmm. somewhere, mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter if you can swim. Mm -hmm. So now, having frightened everybody, <laughs> so they'll never right. go in the water, <laughs> you can uh, start in the bathtub, mm -hmm. and m much of the year it's very safe. Mm -hmm. um, it's not even that deep mm -hmm. uh, in a lot of places. Uh, if you want something that's a little bit more ripply, uh, you can go up towards Unionville mm -hmm. uh, or maybe do uh, certain segments like in People's State Forest uh -huh. up in the West Branch. Yes. 
um, and there are outfitters uh, that can help you get started up sure. there. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you want to get uh, really adventurous, you might try Satan's Kingdom. Mm -hmm. um, and then you might be ready for Terrafil Gorge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but as I say, all of these areas sure. can, can be either much safer or much more dangerous mm -hmm. um, than usual, right. depending on the conditions. Depending on the conditions. And then yeah. I think also, uh, I certainly one of the things I remember from the lecture from Satan Kingdom, Satan's Kingdom was that even though it was shallow, um, that you know oftentimes then that just means that you can easily get your foot stuck or something like that. So yeah, yeah. Um, so that's interesting as well. Yeah, we we warn people if if you find yourself in the river accidentally toes having up. rolled out of a boat, mm -hmm. don't try to stand up. Mm -hmm. You know, just point your toes down the river. Right. And right. You mentioned before volunteers. Yes. Uh, I'd love to hear a little bit more about the different ways volunteers can get involved, whether it's you know helping out to collect samples or um, are there ways that volunteers can help with the education or are there things that uh, people can do just themselves by visiting the website to learn more? Oh, yeah. Um, we try never to lose sight of mm -hmm. the fact that this is a citizens organization. Mm -hmm. um, and we're lucky enough to be able to have hired staff. I, I mentioned Elisa phillips Gregg. She's our um, water quality and projects coordinator. Mm -hmm. uh, there's Amy Petrus. She's our outreach and education coordinator. Mm -hmm. And notice all these people are coordinators. Yes. <laughs> they yes, they yes. coordinate things. Right. Um, and then we also have a, a wonderful uh, mapper. Mm -hmm. uh, he uh, is our GIS mapper who um, is sort of on call mm -hmm. to do projects. And um, all of our um, operations are greatly assisted by volunteers. Mm -hmm. There's uh, water quality sampling. Okay. Um, that actually is a fairly limited size group okay. because there are only just so many samples that we can process. Sure. Um, you know, there's there's some limitations to uh, what our lab facilities can handle. Right. Um, so that tends to be a fairly small group, mm -hmm. um, very dedicated. Mm -hmm. you know, they own that sampling uh, program. Yes. Um, they some of them know how to analyze the samples, mm -hmm. but every now and then uh, somebody rotates away, and there will be an opening. Um, Mm -hmm. for water quality. And uh, then there's a lot of opportunity for um, uh, short-term events. Mm -hmm. um, and the biggest opportunity is our f annual Farmington River cleanup, ah. which we try to coordinate with the Connecticut River source to sea cleanup. Okay. So it's- Is that usually around Earth Day or when is that? No, actually it's in the fall. Oh, okay. Um, because we find that in the springtime, sometimes the water's running really high. Okay, so it can um, be dangerous. Yeah, sure. yeah, and it's cold. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and it's not until the water goes down okay. that, that you can see uh, some of the litter, but then mm -hmm. all the vegetation comes up. Okay. And it's hard to f navigate and it's hard to find. Sure. And, and our cleanup uh, happens to be done from land, mm -hmm. you know, so you don't have to be an expert boater to mm -hmm. do participate in the Farmington River cleanup. So both individuals and uh, community groups, I Absolutely. imagine, can yeah. sign up for that? Whole scout troops. Wonderful. Uh, climb up, uh, mm -hmm. sign up. Mm -hmm. Where did I get Families. Up? <laughs> Could be a great family day. We now. have uh, parents coming with their kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to finish the thought, it's in either in late September, or early October. Uh, ah, most, depending on yeah, the uh, year. Yeah, mm -hmm. depending on when Connecticut River schedules the source to see. Sure. And uh, we have people call up and mm -hmm. say, you know, I can't come that day. And we say, that's okay. Yes. Come and pick up some bags and some gloves. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll supply you with what you need. Wonderful. If you have a place that you want to go clean up, go ahead. You know, on on the actual cleanup day, uh, we make sure that there are dumpsters available. But a lot of people just go and clean things up, and uh, they they even take it take it home with them and dispose of it themselves. themselves. Okay. Yeah. Um, so hundreds of people will participate in that, mm -hmm. uh, and then. Um, 
uh, people will help us with other kinds of outreach and education. Um, one thing we like to do is go to other people's events. Ah. Um, town festivals. Have a presence town there. Fairs. It's a great opportunity to educate. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. We call it tabling. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. <laughs> and it involves going with a display, going with some information, and going with something for interesting for people to do or mm -hmm. to look at and mm -hmm. just get people into a conversation. Mm -hmm. Because for all that uh, we try to go everywhere and do everything yes. and be everybody, there's still a lot of people in the in the valley who haven't heard of the Farmington River Watershed Association. Mm -hmm. And what it does, more and, importantly. And what we do, mm -hmm. yeah. It's it's kind of an unusual nonprofit, mm -hmm. I think, relative to some of the other nonprofits in the area, because so many other nonprofits are human services. Sure. And uh, we're a human service nonprofit as well, because we're making a river for the enjoyment safe and, and healthy safety. and beautiful. Right. Yeah, sure. mm -hmm. but it's it's one step removed. Mm -hmm. Yes. And mm -hmm. so sometimes what we do takes a little explaining. Yes. Um, but when it comes to helping people celebrate the river mm -hmm. and, and learn about it. Now um, you were telling me uh, earlier before we came on air about mm -hmm. a wonderful interactive uh, program, I think on your website, uh, mm -hmm. you'll correct me if I'm wrong, where individuals could decide or learn about maybe or pledge to do a few things to help the watershed area by perhaps doing things around the home, like conserving water. Can mm -hmm. you tell me a little bit or tell our viewers a little bit more about that? I would love to. <laughs> um, again, because this is a community organization mm -hmm. and it's the community taking care of the river, it's really important for us to get the word out that the Clean Water Act took care of sewage mm -hmm. and industrial waste, but then there was sort of chapter two to okay. the Clean Water Act, mm -hmm. and that was, and then we will address the rest of the pollution problem in the river mm -hmm. that's much less visible. Mm -hmm. um, it's called, by various names, it's called non-point source pollution, okay. which is to say it's coming from everywhere mm -hmm. instead of just one place. Right. Um, and uh, quite frequently it's referred to as the stormwater runoff. Mm -hmm. So big rainstorm, um, what's sluicing off of the roads down into the storm drains. Right. Or big snow melt at the end of the winter. Mm -hmm. Like right All now. All of that melt water. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> what's going on right yes. now? Um, going down storm drains. A lot of people stop thinking about the water once it's down the drain. Because in your house, mm -hmm. that's going to a wastewater treatment plant. Yes. But down the storm drain in the road right. or the parking lot, very likely it's going untreated straight into a waterway. Mm -hmm. So that's sand and salt and all the chemicals that might drip off a car. That's and lawns, herbicides, right? mm -hmm. pesticides, right. fertilizers mm -hmm. are good for plants uh, if you're trying Not to grow them. for watershed. They're pollutants once they get into the water mm -hmm. in, in quantities that are abnormal mm -hmm. for a river or a stream or for Long Island Sound mm -hmm. because that's where a lot of this ends up. Right. So um, pet waste. You know, mm -hmm. people think, oh, that's natural, it's mm -hmm. organic. Mm -hmm. Well, not in the concentrations that it, it goes down storm drains. Okay. So um, all of this stormwater runoff mm -hmm. and the contaminants in it mm -hmm. is now the number one pollution problem mm -hmm. that the Farmington River has. Wow. And it's us. Yes, you know, yes, yes. It's individuals. Mm -hmm. It's individual um, houses, homes, yards, neighborhoods, businesses. Mm -hmm. Um, roadways and right. so on and so we all have to be taking action mm -hmm. individually mm -hmm. and that's where the River Smart program came from. Mm -hmm. It was developed a couple of years ago um, in Connecticut uh, by the Housatonic Valley Association, the Pomparog mm -hmm. River Watershed Coalition, and uh, the Wiantanog Land Trust. Mm -hmm. So more, more people that we collaborate with. Wonderful, yes. Uh, we got on board mm -hmm. um, and a couple of other organizations have gotten on board and now there is a website mm -hmm. which is ctriversmart.org so ctriversmart.org, great, mm -hmm. thank you. And you can go there to find out what you can do, and it, some of it's very simple, around your, your home or your yard mm -hmm. um, or your school mm -hmm. to reduce the amount of 
uh, contaminated runoff mm -hmm. that uh, that leaves your immediate vicinity. Mm -hmm. Some of it is what people are already doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the reasons for the website, besides just giving people information about what they can do because yes. they want to do the right thing, right. it's a way for us to find out who's participating. Right. So we know how many people ah. are doing this because, of course, uh, they put in their, uh, mm -hmm. their email address. Mm -hmm. So uh, we know how many mm -hmm. people are involved. And then we have more information, more materials uh, that we can send them. Wonderful. So you can start a conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have a class or you have a scout troop or you it's just want to do this a uh, homeschool group mm -hmm. or if you're just an interested citizen, yes, you know, yes. you can get the communication going. And this so. is, sounds like it's something that people could share on Facebook or different things. They can say that oh, they've yeah. got, they've taken the pledge at CT Smart, uh, uh, River CT Smart, River Smart .org. River Smart org, and, yeah. and it's a nice thing to share that probably is not uh, as controversial as some of the things people are sharing these days on Facebook. So mm, it's very oh, yeah. exciting. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and I think it's interesting, too, because you noted, uh, for instance, the pet waste issue. You know, yeah. most people think, well, that's natural, so, you know, it's okay if we don't yeah. pick it up or something like that. But your mm -hmm. point being that in the percentages, uh, you know, if, if this waste isn't disposed of properly, that's too much for the river to bear. So that's really interesting. I know yeah. um, in the reservoirs around here, uh, when people walk, they are told to clean up their pet's waste, and I'm sure it must be for that reason as well. Oh, yes, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and so much of it in uh, a neighborhood, mm -hmm. not to get into more detail than mm -hmm. we want to, but a lot of it is, uh, landing on lawns mm -hmm. or on uh, hard surfaces. Mm -hmm. And lawns are more pervious than pavement, mm -hmm. but nowhere near as pervious as, for example, uh, living rich forest soil. The woods, right, right, yeah. right. Okay. So the opportunity for this stuff to break down mm -hmm. and, and be naturally processed mm -hmm. by microorganisms in the soil mm -hmm. um, is much less in the areas where most of it is landing. Yes, okay. Um, so, and we're talking trillions of bacteria. Uh, you mentioned storm drains earlier. Yes. Some of the storm drains, I think maybe even in my neighborhood, uh, have a little fish uh, logo on them and it says drains to river or something like that. Mm -hmm. Is that, uh, who, who puts those uh, on some of the storm drains around? That is actually another volunteer opportunity. Ah, wonderful. Um, okay. If there's a group in a particular town mm -hmm. that wants to make sure that everybody gets reminded mm -hmm. that it matters what goes down that storm drain, yes. um, we have the stencils right in our office, uh -huh. and uh, the stencils are available from other organizations as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you need permission from the town. Uh -huh. uh, this isn't something you can't go around just painting the roads. As a vigilante. <laughs> yes. You have to, yes, yeah. yes. And there's a safety aspect of that. To, uh, you know, being out in the road, sure, um, stenciling mm -hmm. things, mm -hmm. um, but it's a wonderful way mm -hmm. uh, for a community group to mm -hmm. remind itself about mm -hmm. this and to raise some consciousness. Sure. Um, I think that's great for community groups, but also um, I know when my children were both in high school, there were certain community service um, activities, hours or so forth that they mm -hmm. had to do, and that would be a very interesting um, project again with the town approval yeah. for a few of the students to do because I know that so many young people do care very much about the environment so it would be a nice way to affect that. Oh yeah and and we do get calls from high school students mm -hmm. um, or high school classes mm -hmm. uh, what can we do? Sure. Uh, we would like to volunteer mm -hmm. and um, I will admit, mm -hmm. we don't have something every week of the year mm -hmm. that volunteers can just kick into, mm -hmm. participate in, mm -hmm. and uh, you know there's this constant sure. turnover of uh, some project that needs to be maintained by volunteers. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of on again, off again mm -hmm. when it comes to volunteer opportunities. But uh, one of the things that we've had wonderful volunteer mm -hmm. help on, um, especially from school groups, uh, but also from uh, corporate groups who have volunteer days is removing invasive plants ah. 
from the river floodplain. Mm -hmm. um, now, a lot of people already know that invasive plants are uh, plants from other parts of the world mm -hmm. that have come here without their usual attendant uh, pathogens and predators and parasites. Right. So they have this wonderful competitive advantage yes. against our hardworking local plants <laughs> sure, right, right, right. That, that are up against all of those mm -hmm. things. And so they can spread out, choke out our native stuff mm -hmm. and um, come to dominate an area. Mm -hmm. And then the habitat's not as good for the local insects and birds and reptiles and amphibians mm -hmm. uh, because that's not a plant they're used to. Mm -hmm. um, well, that happens a lot, as it turns out, along riverbanks oh. because plants like that mm -hmm. tend to be really good at moving in on recently disturbed areas. Ah, sure. Well, that's the definition of a river floodplain. Yes, yes, you know, yes. They get scoured by ice, they get mm -hmm. flooded, there's a lot of transition on, on a river floodplain, so uh, that's where invasives tend to really pro proliferate. And we're not mm -hmm. gonna get rid of them all, mm -hmm. but we like to protect some areas yes. for our native uh, species to continue to live. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we do send whole groups of kids mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. out onto, uh, and adults, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Out onto sure. river flood community plains. groups, yeah, sure. to mm -hmm. pull up Japanese barberry, mm -hmm. garlic mustard, mm. burning bush, mm. Asiatic bittersweet, uh, and uh, a host of other things. Although those are some of the big targets, yeah. and we've actually worked with a consulting botanist, mm -hmm. uh, Bill Moorhead, mm -hmm. and uh, made some great progress Wonderful. in some areas, yeah. uh, clearing clearing areas that then stay cleared and, and native plants come and up come back uh, yes, for several yes. years at a time. Wonderful. And for that we have to thank uh, in part the um, lower River, Lower Farmington River Salmon Brook Wild and Scenic Study Committee. Ah. Uh, they've worked with us a lot on that. Great. Um, because the Farmington River um, is a wi national wild and scenic river. Ah. But only part of it. Okay. Um, the West Branch, mm -hmm. which is that that beautiful, beautiful recreational West Branch, mm -hmm. qualified for that federal designation back in 1994. Mm -hmm. It's uh, a national wild and scenic river, mm -hmm. which means that we get some help from the National Park Service, oh. um, and it's help. Yes. It's not orders. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, good. The so national, it's another ally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The National Park Service does not call the shots. Mm -hmm. It's just that the the funding mm -hmm. to the local group mm -hmm. of river stakeholders who mm -hmm. are the ones who developed the management plan, right. which is just an advisory management plan. It's it's a series of well thought out good ideas for what should yes. happen on the river. Um, they get f uh, federal help mm -hmm. for implementing that plan uh, that's channeled through the National Park Service, mm -hmm. and the National Park Service also also supplies um, technical assistance in the form of staff help. Mm -hmm. um, Liz Lacey is the National Park Service um, coordinator mm -hmm. for the Farmington River Coordinating Committee group up on the West Branch. Mm -hmm. And for a number of years now, we have been trying to get wild and scenic designation for the Lower River. Ah. And it was the Lower River Study Committee mm -hmm. um, that really helped us get going on the invasive Invasive project. species. Yeah, oh. uh, along with uh, the botanist Bill Moorhead. Good. Well, we have a few minutes left, and I think that this is a good place to circle back around to the advocacy piece, which was really what created yes. the association to begin with. And I do want to give you an opportunity to let us know um, on the, we're sort of in the middle of the legislative session, certainly right. in the state, and uh, we've seen at least the first pass of a, a national um, proposed budget by the president, mm -hmm. which certainly does um, gut a lot of protections in the EPA and, and uh, mm -hmm. um, probably the National Park Service as well. I'm not positive about that. But uh, if we have viewers who are interested in um, writing to their senators, to their local representatives, what, uh, what type of advocacy are you recommending mm. or does the mm -hmm. association uh, engage in right now? Well. Um, we stand uh, right at this moment mm -hmm. in the legislative session and in the state of federal politics. Sure. Um, we're worried mm -hmm. about losing some very key partners. Mm -hmm. 
um, the Council on Environmental Quality okay. at, at the state level. Mm -hmm. It's an independent watchdog mm -hmm. that publishes the state of the environment in Connecticut every year mm -hmm. and also does a critique of the performance of DEEP. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's a, a very vital function, and they provide information about a lot of environmental issues that, that we use. Okay. Um, that is not only uh, possibly going to be defunded, it may possibly be eliminated altogether. So that's the Council on, on Environmental Quality. On Environmental Quality. So mm -hmm. if somebody wanted to contact their it. state representative and talk about um, urging them to protect that. Yeah, and mm -hmm. that's an issue in the state budget. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, there are also uh, bills in the legislature that have to do with amending the state constitution mm -hmm. so that um, state open space, mm -hmm. state preserved lands um, cannot easily be conveyed uh, to someone else mm -hmm. um, without more public input. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that uh, something that is given to the state in perpetuity mm -hmm. remains protected in right. perpetuity. So somebody who cares about that would also want to call and say that they want that um, that constitutional amendment. Um, that's something that they would support. Yes. Great. Yes, definitely. And Wonderful. and on the federal level, mm -hmm. um, we don't know what's going to happen it's a moving to the National right Park now. Service sure. budget. Mm -hmm. We don't know what's going to happen to the mm -hmm. EPA. Mm -hmm. uh, worst case scenario, mm -hmm. an organization like ours could lose tens of thousands in support. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. uh, I'm confident mm -hmm. uh, because the basis of this organization has its roots in the community. Mm -hmm. The community has always been really the driving force mm -hmm. that keeps FRWA going mm -hmm. and that's not going away. Wonderful. So we will adapt. We will adapt. Yes. Eileen, thank you so much for being with us uh, today. The website again is F. Uh, rwa.org. Please visit it for all this information and more. Thank you. For fish, it's a highway to ancient spawning grounds. For migrating birds, its green ribbon of trees offers shelter and food. We too depend on the Farmington River and the valley that it shaped. Our own highways run alongside it. For thousands of years, people have lived in its broad, fertile lowlands and fished from the rocks in its rapids. People harnessed the river's power to run factories. Before there were roads, the river was our road. And we can still journey on that road. It will show us something vital, something that our river must have. It's the forest, holding the soil, absorbing the rain, shading the water, feeding the insects. Forested land is the river's partner, keeping it clean, cool, and full of life. Once it was nearly destroyed by pollution and dams. Now the Farmington River is home once again to fish and fishing and to the otters, bears, eagles, and other wild animals that have returned. Everywhere it's a meeting ground for the old and the new, the wild landscape and the human world. Where railroads once rolled along the river, now people drift on the current, enjoying all that this natural treasure offers. We are so close to this river. It's a part of our history. It's part of our daily lives. And for more than 60 years, we have been bringing it back to life. That job isn't finished. There is still much to do, but we know how to do it. If we want the river to run silver again with thousands of fish from the sea, 
if we want it to run as clean and clear in our towns as it does in the forest, if we want it to sustain our communities and our spirits, we know what to do. We can be stewards of this treasure. Those who value the river most can help build the bridge to its future.